Yo! So I just finished playing through Act 5 of Sumeru's Archon Quest where the fate of Sumeru is decided, and then holy smokes, we got some big lore drops. I know we get a Q&A session each time we finish a nation's Archon Quest, but I feel like the answers from Nahida reveal to us so much more lore, which is to be expected as we progress through more nations, and we're that much more closer to figure out the truth. But still, this time we got some very, very interesting information. There's a ton to talk about, so feel free to check out the video timestamps for my thoughts on specific parts of the act. Without further ado, here are my thoughts on Sumeru's Archon Quest, Act 5, Akasha Pulses, The Copple Flame Rises. We start off with everyone meeting up to discuss the plan to take down the sages. It's made clear that the plan we have is very risky. Candace wants us to promise her that we'll stay safe above all else. I definitely get a final boss vibe as well, like we're in the endgame now since it feels like we're saying our goodbyes to everyone before heading out to defeat the big bad. We already start with a surprising information reveal where Alhaitham straight up tells us that the Ermin soul is sick because of corruption from forbidden knowledge. While it does make sense for me to draw this conclusion, I did feel a little taken aback when we were just told directly that this is the case. But upon thinking about it more, I do think it's logical for the characters to make this conclusion given that in the King Dishret flashback, the symptoms we see today are very similar effects that forbidden knowledge brought about in the past. Given that Ruka Devada was able to halt the spread of forbidden knowledge, it makes it all the more important that we rescue Nahida to then find the remaining consciousness of Ruka Devada to save Erminsoul. We go meet with the scholars responsible for the kidnappings and they're helping Alhaitham with modifications to the Akasha terminal. He asks us to record our conviction into knowledge capsules, but I'm a little unsure how this plays out in the later story. Sure, the Traveler becomes more sure of their own conviction to save Nahida, but I don't quite understand how conviction was used against the Academia later on. I do like how Ahaitham emphasizes the problems of relying on the Akasha, how it can make someone a slave to orders. The Akasha really does touch up on modern internet themes, where it's easy for people to just believe anything they read on the internet. It's important for people to still be able to think for themselves, since things aren't always black and white. I think it's fitting how Al Haitham emphasizes gray, ambiguous areas, since it tells me that he's likely a morally gray character, reflected in his behaviors and with his gray hair as well. We meet up with Sino and the Eremites, and it gives us the start of improved relationships between the Rainforest folks and the Eremites. While Rahman and the Eremites value the mission goal above all else, they understand Sino's point about also valuing the lives of allies. Their shared dream of overthrowing the Academia for a unification of Sumeru is what helps to extinguish the animosity between the Rainforest folks and the Desert folk. In summary, their plan is to fake arrest the Eremites in order to get them into the Sumeru city. This act then reveals to us how we will be finding out what the plan is by retroactively showing the plan discussion through sets of flashbacks. One of the reasons for the plan working is that the Akasha won't be able to easily predict the group's movements, given that the Akasha only considers the logical aspects of people's actions, and not the important emotional aspects as well. I think for another future video, I definitely want to elaborate on the various story themes that are told in Sumeru through the Akasha device. Sino also says a quote that I think fits a lot of the later part of this quest, how people won't always be trapped by the past, and that it's important to move on from it. The fake arrest of Eremites is a success, so we move on to working with Dea. Our goal with Dea is to ensure that Dottori won't be involved in the plan. We meet with Tignity at Party's DI where he gives us intel on Dottori. Dottori recently left Party's DI after failing to get a hold of Hapasia, wanting to take her to Shneshnaya, presumably for experimentations on how she connected her consciousness to Scaramouche. Tignity denied his request, I have to say, I really really like how both Tignori and Dottori were portrayed in their interactions. Despite knowing Dottori is number 2 of the Harbingers, Tignori just held his ground and refused to let Dottori get what he wanted, and also criticized Dottori's ignorance and overconfidence. On the other hand, I found it interesting how Dottori didn't really argue back, just commenting that Tignori wasn't what he expected. Especially his quote about how everyone will eventually pay the price for what they've learned. Which makes me wonder what prices Dottori's had to pay for all of his knowledge, including how to create segments, as well as the fake skies of Tevat. 
Dottori needs to leave Sumeru because the Saritsa is calling back all Harbingers, so definitely something critical has happened in Shneshnaya that warrants calling everyone back. I would think that the event is on a similar or bigger scale to Signora's funeral, where we saw all of the Harbingers gathered. But yeah, overall, given Dottori's high threat level, I'm very impressed with how Tignity held his ground and conviction to protect Hapeja. Tignity and Sino's direct yet sincere relationship and friendship is also highlighted again, which I like seeing. Now, Dea helps us track down Dottori down to Port Ormos, which is interesting because I think that implies Shneshnaya is maybe somewhere to the south? I get that Port Ormos is the main harbor in Sumeru, but it just makes me think about where Shneshnaya really is on the map. Anyways, Dottori becomes aware of her presence and shows off that he's got the power of dreams, giving us hallucinations. I wonder if these powers could be the result of his experiments he's been conducting here in Sumeru, and maybe the dream machines back in 2.8's Golden Apple Archipelago. We rush back to our party's DI to help Tignuri engage against Fatui, which again, I love how Tignuri gives off a strong conviction against the Fatui. After checking on Hepasia, Skarumusht contacts us through our consciousness, because we just touched Hepasia. He says a lot of interesting things that show off more of his characterization, which I think is great for us to understand his motives more. To sum it up, I think he believes that his only purpose in life is to become a god because that's what A created him for in the first place, to host her gnosis. But because she tossed him aside, he feels that he needs to prove himself, which I think is misguided. Despite this, I appreciate the seemingly genuine concern in his voice when the traveler tells him that someone is trying to hurt Hapasia, his first follower as a god. Who wants to hurt my devout follower? It gives an interesting dynamic where despite disliking humans, he values followers. He confirms that he's not really in cahoots with Dottori, which confirms one of my thoughts because both of them have different usages for the Electronosis. Also, he just zapped all the Fatui to death with his lightning, so yeah. Anyways, there's a lot more to Skaramouche than what I'm talking about, but I'll save a video for him for the next update where we will be getting him as the Wanderer. And with the situation at Party's DI resolved, we head to the Grand Bazaar where everyone updates on each of their royal successes. Alhaitham has the modified Akasha, Sino has brought the Eremites into the city, and Dea confirms that Dottori should be out of Sumeru. And lastly, we recruit the final member of our dream team, Nilu. I like how she's the one who gives the best words of encouragement to everyone before sleeping for the night, since the Zubair Theater is known for their support of people in the theater, so she's used to this kind of support. And here we are on Nagarbaha Day, where the Academia spends the day filling the Akasha with new updated information. It's basically like the patch update days for Genshin. Back in Act 2 in the Samsara, the Grand Sage mentioned that on the next Nagarbaha Day, they'll initiate a ban for public performances, and that's exactly what's happening here. The Grand Sage Azar straight up meets us in the house of Dana, so that makes things easier for us. While I do get that Azar is mainly an NPC in the grand scheme of things, I kind of wish that he had more dimension to his character other than just being some greedy sage for knowledge. His own spiel is that knowledge is literally above all else, including Gnosis, and that it's imperative that there's a worthy god of wisdom leading Sumeru to further knowledge. But this is already stuff we knew from the previous Archon quests. We know that the sages are obsessed with knowledge, and there doesn't seem to be anything deeper to Azar's character. I can't help but feel like this makes him feel like a really generic bad guy, but it's fine, I think, as there is still more to the plot after this. In the cutscene with Alhaitham, he intentionally uses divine knowledge on himself to drop Azar's guard in order to swap his modified knowledge capsule to Azar. I feel like this was likely the most risky part of the plan since he deliberately accepted the risks that come with using divine knowledge. It was a good thing he got knocked out relatively quickly because otherwise who knows what other side effects he would have had had he been under the influence for longer. But he was confident that the sages wouldn't suspect the acting so that gamble paid off. Which gives Nilu her cue to start a wonderful performance outside the academia, which then prompts Azar to distribute his public performance ban to the Akasha, which then activates Alhaitham's trap card where his modified Akasha terminal distributes a fake message about Kusanali having escaped which then prompts the guards to leave their posts, leaving the Academia guard free now. So basically, Alhaitham gave Azar the equivalent of an internet virus, which distributed fake news. Goes to show how the danger of blindly listening to orders from the Akasha can backfire. 
I kinda like how Izak was used in this act, impersonating Nahida to lead the guards to the Grand Bazaar where Dea and Raman with the Eremites take care of them. It's interesting to me how accurate Izak's cosplay is, since, to my knowledge, only Traveler and Paimon have seen Nahida's appearance, so I guess they were really detailed when describing Nahida's appearance to the group? Anyways, Mazar is so shook by the false order that he goes to confirm Kusanali's status in the sanctuary where he's then apprehended by Sino, which pays off Sino's past claims to cast judgment upon the sages. So now, everyone's roles have succeeded again, which gives Traveler the opportunity to connect to Nahida's consciousness to try and free her, since she previously sealed it off after being captured by Dottore. We don't really get through to her since she's feeling all the weight of her imposter syndrome, but eventually she does reach deep down into her own voice and hears Ruka Devada's words of encouragement, which prompts Nahida to finally give herself a chance for the first time, finally waking up. There's a lot to unpack with Nahida's character, her lack of self-worth as an Archon, and how she's now accepted herself. I'm going to save all of this discussion for my Nahida analysis video after I play through her story quest, after this video releases. But yeah, we free her and she's able to physically step into the world for the first time, on this Nagarbaha day. We get a really cute upgraded Akasha terminal from her, which looks like it might be a pet in the future. She then says something that made me feel a little sus, which is that an Archon's power is derived from their people's faith. Which is sus to me because this implies that Venti should be very strong since the people of Mondstadt adore Barbados. To this day, I think Mondstadt shows the most devotion to their god out of the other nations. However, in Act 3 of Mondstadt's Archon Quest, Venti claimed that an Archon's power comes from ruling their respective nation, and he hasn't ruled Mondstadt, so he considers himself one of the weakest amongst the seven. So, what Nahida says here kind of makes sense to me, but it does slightly contradict what Venti said, so either one or both of their claims are inaccurate, or maybe the writing changed. It's a small detail, but it was a surprise when Nahida said it. So now, with Nahida freed and the sages apprehended, we just have to resolve the situation with the balladeer, Scaramouche. He name drops Nahida's demon name, Buer. So now, amongst the other Archons, Barbados, Morax, Beelzebul, we now have Buer. It's strange to me that Scaramouche hasn't received any divine knowledge. I don't quite get the narrative purpose behind this, because part of what the sages were doing was hoarding divine knowledge capsules to supply to Scaramouche, but yet for some reason they weren't able to give it to him? Then what was the whole purpose of gathering the capsules? Hopefully it still pays off later somehow, Dottore? Question mark? There's a lot of great dialogue between Scaramouche and Nahida, and continued symbolism with Scaramouche attaining godhood yet still remaining a puppet to fate, where he feels his own form of inferiority complex without a gnosis. But again, I want to leave more detailed thoughts on my analysis video in the dex update when Wanderer is out. I would say that the boss fight, while visually amazing, played a little underwhelming. I didn't really understand what was going on, but we just had to gather energy for our terminal pet to hit Scaramouche, so maybe I'll get a better sense of the fight when I fight the weekly boss version? But it was really dope seeing him use several elements in his attacks, and the godly music playing in the background. Anyways, the main way we defeat him is by support from Nahida, who puts him under samsara. This allows Nahida to gather and relay information about him to the people of Sumeru, who she asks to come up with ideas to defeat him. With the Traveler accepting all the gathered wisdom of the people, they become the first sage of Buer and bring Scaramouche down. Nahida proceeds to take the Electronosis, which throws him into a state of helplessness. He literally begs Nahida to not take away the only thing he relies on, and Nahida does hesitate doing so, but knows that it's likely the right thing to do. And so, without his reason to live, I think Scaramouche starts his descent from godhood into becoming the Wanderer. Gosh, there is so much I want to talk about with this character, but I gotta wait until we see the story of the Wanderer in the next update. Overall, while the fight seemed underwhelming from a gameplay perspective, I really enjoyed the storytelling of it and the dialogue between the characters, which is more valuable to me in an Archon quest. Now, with the powers of the Electro and Dendronoses, we reach Rika Devada's final memory in the Ermensoul. Nahida gives a quick clarification of timelines where she confirms two instances of forbidden knowledge. The first was thousands of years ago when King Desret sacrificed himself, 
The second instance was during the Cataclysm, where Rika Devada couldn't stop the spread all by herself this time, so she exerted all her power. When we reach Soul, it's revealed that Nahida is in fact not technically Rika Devada like I assumed from the Desert flashback. What actually happened was that Rika Devada exerted all her power, turned into the child we see now, and then created Nahida. To put it in an analogy, Rika Devada was like a dying tree and Nahida was born through Rika Devada's purest branch. So while they both are from the same being, they're their own different beings. Rika Devada mentions that this is just another samsara, implying that the entirety of Teyvat is a cycle, and that Nahida is starting out the same way that Rika Devada started out. I think it depends on exactly what samsara refers to in this case, but it likely relates to how Nahida has said that everything in this world runs in a loop. During the Cataclysm, Rika Devada was the only one of the seven Archons that didn't go to Kanria, since she had to protect Erminsul. But somehow, the second instance of Forbidden Knowledge came into play from the bottom of the Abyss. It's really mysterious what Forbidden Knowledge is, but all we know is that it cannot stay in this world, and so she received help from all her people via the Akasha to try to contain it. She was already corrupted from the first instance of Forbidden Knowledge with King Dishret, and due to her connection with Erminsul, it was also polluted with it. She didn't have enough strength left to combat it, so she created Nahida in the hopes that one day Nahida would arrive here to clear her memory. Because so long as Rika Devada's consciousness remains, Erminsul will continue to be plagued by forbidden knowledge, so Rika Devada's existence just needs to be wiped from Teyvat. As she says, let the world completely forget me. The cutscene that follows is probably one of the most heartfelt and emotional ones of Genshin so far. I certainly cried. In one final embrace, Rika Devada leaves the rest to Nahida, who reluctantly has to let Rika Devada go. I can't help but feel really sad because it's clear how difficult this is for Nahida. She's finally free, and then has to immediately go through with the loss of the family she never knew she had. Rika Devada emphasizes how valuable dreams are, how they're the one thing that help awaken people from even the deepest of darknesses, and all the dreams that the Akasha has taken from the people of Sumeru are returned to them. With Rika Devada's existence now erased, so is Forbidden Knowledge, which also cures Elazar, saving both Dunyarzad and Kole. I feel like this theme of dreams will be recurring in the future story, since in the Teyvat story trailer, Dainsleaf mentions that there are those who dream of dreaming. Nahida's reaction upon forgetting Rika Devada is very natural. While she's lost the logical memories of Rika Devada, it's the emotional attachment that she had to her that's not so easy to get rid of. I think we can all tell that Nahida feels like she's lost a part of herself. It's important to note here that Traveler is the only one who remembers Ruka Devada since they're not from this world. This confirms that Paimon is from this world, and while that seemed to have always been the case, I still think it's important to note. And the Doctor is back. Doctor who? Doctor Dottore. Well, not exactly the same one from before, but rather another segment. And the interaction between him and Nahida here is one of my favorites. He confirms that he has segments of himself from different times in life in order to fuel his thirst for knowledge. He's someone who views most things as mere experiments, including this ho Scaramouche godhood fiasco. I like that he shows respect for Nahida when she gives him a gamble. Nahida looked really strong here, using the bluff of threatening to awaken the heavenly principles by destroying a gnosis. Dottori sees this as a threat to the point where he actually supposedly destroys all his other segments in exchange for the Electronosis. I'm convinced that he actually did destroy them because of all the other segments in his head yelling against it. But then the voices disappear. Nahida confirms it, and that's also enough for me. But like he mentions later, it's just a minor setback. While segments take great effort to create, he can always create more. Also, it seemed like he effortlessly destroyed all of the other segments, so I wonder if any segment can destroy the others at any time. The way he acquired the Dendronosis was also well done too, since he literally exchanged a huge piece of knowledge with the God of Wisdom herself. This rumor of the skies in Teyvat being fake is something first said by Scaramouche back in 1.1's Unreconciled Stars, and because this is the secret hidden in the Erminsul, 
It makes sense that Scaramouche likely made contact with the Armin Soul when he learned the truth. Of course, the game doesn't tell us what the secret really means, but hey, maybe Scaramouche might remember some of it, and the Wanderer might give us a few crumbs here and there. This is just my copium talking. But overall, it's really intriguing to me just how many secrets the Harpingers know, so imagine by the time we finish Nezhnaya's Archon Quest and the Tsaritsa drops all the truths of the world to us. I'm with this game for the long term, so I always look forward to the next nations and its lore. And finally, all the tense moments of the Archon Quest are now over, and it's time for some celebration. I'll just speedrun them here. Kole is healed and is doing much better, which is fantastic to hear. She has two new voice lines unlocked now about how she finally feels free to live her life, so that makes me happy to see. Nilu is holding a celebration feast to celebrate Sino being Mahamatra again and invites everyone. Tignori can't join, but he will oversee the sages who are now working in Avidya Forest, paying for their actions via cultivating wisdom for the forest. We meet Alhaitham's roommate Kabe, who's an architect, and they apparently have a tough relationship with each other. Looking forward to seeing them as playable characters. It's pretty funny how Kabe was busy with a construction project in the desert, and yet Alhaitham paid no visit to him when he was there. Alhaitham refused the position of Grand Sage, since he prefers scribing, not leading. There's still a mysterious aura to him, so let's see how his story goes when he's playable. At Port Ormos, Dea and Dunyarzad are together again, and it's great seeing Dunyarzad in great health. I like that Dea wants to continue with riskier jobs, and I hope that she brings down the Wall of Samiel one day. At Aru Village, we see Sino and Raman with Sataria, who's turned a new leaf to continue pursuing knowledge but not with the Academia, and rather on her own terms. Sino is leading Kusanali's efforts to support and develop the desert, so Sumeru's rainforest and desert folks will slowly unite with each other. Wish we got to hear some Candace dialogue, but oh well. At the Grand Bazaar, it's stated that the history now is that Kusanali was always the Archon, but was abandoned by the Academia in the past, with no mentions of Rukadavada. Traveler believes they're the only ones who remembers Rukadavada, but I argue that the sibling likely knows as well. Nahida wants to celebrate with us, and I wish she came in person, but I'll accept that she uses the Traveler's body to be present. And yeah, a great celebration follows. Okay, and now, the treat that we get at the end of every Archon Quest, the lore drops. Nahida's answers are definitely the most elaborative and insightful of the ones we've gotten so far. She shuts down the Akasha permanently? This feels thematic since it was originally Ruka Devada's great invention, but since Ruka Devada is no more, it makes sense that the legacy of the Akasha is gone with her. The top three Harbingers, Piero, Dottori, and Damselette, have powers comparable to gods, which hypes them up even more. Scaramouche is in a coma state, being washed over by Nahida. It's likely that he'll forget his memories through some Erminsoul magic and then start a new life as Wanderer. I do hope that he retains some of his memories since I think it's important that he accepts the mistakes of his past, but we'll wait and see. The Hydro Archon's name is Fosalores, and she's got a very unique personality. Based on the fact that she involves herself in the everyday trials of Fontaine, we can expect her to be pretty involved like Nahida in the Fontaine Archon quests. And finally, some actual information about our sibling. It's very interesting that the sibling is considered from this world because their actions are captured in the Ermensoul, whereas the Traveler isn't. I'm pretty sure that someone made some changes to make it seem like the sibling is from this world, since it's also said that when the sibling was near the end of their journey in Teyvat, their fate is obfuscated in the Ermensoul. Did the Abyss do this? Did some other higher order being like Istaroth or the Primordial One or even the Heavenly Principles do this? Hmm, questions to ponder. The Fatui do note the sibling to not be a descender, which are beings that are not from this world. The Traveler is Tevat's fourth descender. The fact that the Fatui have noted at least three other descenders, because maybe there are more descenders after the Traveler, is super indicative of how much lore the Fatui know. It's just overall really, really fascinating stuff, and I'm glad that Genshin has so much interesting lore, as it'll make the next years all the more enjoyable. So yeah, big shoutouts to Nahida for all the lore that she gave us, and that she's finally free now. Can't wait for the eventual Archon interactions. Phew! Wow, that was a long, long quest with a lot of good moments. 
overall, I really really enjoyed the quest, and I think it does further the story of Genshin by a good amount. Mainly, Ermin's soul has been cured, yet we still know that Dottori will eventually burn it. Dottori has brought back the Electro and Dendronosis to Shneshnaya, and the Traveler is more aware of their place in this world, their siblings, and the Heavenly Principles. Also, I'm glad to see that Sumeru is finally coming around to Kusanali because she has been a great Archon so far, and I hope she really understands that, and continues to be an even better one than Ruka Devada. Now, Genshin's story isn't really high stakes right now, which I think is fine because of what the game is, where the main selling point is trying to get players to get and buy characters. But I do appreciate all these character moments that we get, and I do think there is good character development, especially in this Archon quest. We saw a lot of these characters interacting with each other, each with their own ideals towards a common goal, which I think is wonderful. The most notable interactions to me were Tiknori Dottore, Nahida Ruka Devada, and Nahida Dottore. Sumeru is the midpoint of the Seven Nations, and I think the progress made in its own Archon quest seems fine for the overall story. We still have around 9 more months until Fontaine, so there's time for more Archon quests like interlude chapters and ones involving Dainsleaf and the sibling. Specifically, I'd love to see more characters from the Abyss, like maybe Child's Master Skirk, because I feel like the Abyss Order should be more involved in the overall Archon quests, and have characters that are more than just Abyss monsters. I think the story is in a place that makes sense for the midpoint of Genshin's story where we're finally acknowledging the sibling and the heavenly principles more. There are plenty of new lore drops that give us food for thought. But yeah, while there are some things I think could have been improved in the Archon quests, overall I really really enjoyed playing through each act, and I'm all the more hyped for the future. I'll be playing Nahita Story Quest next, so I'm hoping to make a video analyzing Nahita's character soon. And yeah, this was the longest video I've made, but I think this last act of Sumeru deserved it. Props to Hoyoverse for the great Sumeru Archon quests, and as always, I'm hyped for more Genshin Story content. So, that'll conclude my current thoughts on Sumeru's Archon Quest Act 5. Thank you for watching this video, and as always, till next time, take care.